Good morning, College Place. We're so glad that you're with us. Sorry we couldn't have in-person worship today, but we wanted to have this service available for you so you could watch it uh, in home with your family, with your loved ones. Hope your Thanksgiving day and your Thanksgiving weekend uh, was all that you wanted it to be. And I uh, hope you didn't eat too much. I cannot say the same. We're coming to you on this Sunday, November 28th. Uh, with this video worship service, and we don't have a lot of announcements for you today, but a couple of things I want to remind you of. Uh, next Sunday, uh, December 5th, we'll be back for in-person worship. Both services will offer Holy Communion at both services, so we'll look forward to seeing you uh, next Sunday, December 5th. And then the only other announcement, uh, hopefully you've already seen this on your email, uh, we're doing a love offering for Trudy Jones, our longtime church secretary. Trudy's been with us and served at College Place United Methodist Church faithfully for over 22 years. Sadly, she's leaving us. Uh, Friday, December 10th is her last day. Uh, to say thank you, uh, we're taking up a love offering for Trudy, and we want to give you an opportunity to participate in that. Uh, hope you'll keep Trudy in your prayers. She uh, and Francis moving to Fernandina Beach uh, to be there with her fiancé, Dean, and so uh, not only during the holidays, but this coming year, Trudy and Dean uh, are moving Trudy. Uh, they've got to plan a wedding. A lot going on, so let's pray for them. If you want to participate in the love offering, you've got a couple of options. First of all, you can mail us a check. Uh, make that out to College Place United Methodist Church. Just make sure that you put on the check for Trudy Jones. Um, or secondly, you can put the check physically in the offering this coming Sunday. December 5th. Now, the deadline to get it to us, either in person or mail it, is Tuesday, December 7th. So just keep that in mind. And uh, like I said, make it out to College Place United Methodist Church. Just make sure that you mark uh, what it's for. Those are the announcements for the day.
your face is all I see and when your eyes are on this child your grace abounds to me oh Lord Light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. I want to take. Shine it all around. First, help me just, just to live it, Lord. And when I'm doing well, help me to never seek a crown for my reward. Is giving glory to you. is all I see when your eyes are on this child your grace abounds to me and when your eyes are on this child your grace This last Sunday of November is always an odd Sunday in the Christian calendar. It doesn't fall this way every year, but a lot of years it is not only the last Sunday of November, the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend, it is also the first Sunday of Advent, and that is true this year. Uh, my sermon, in just a few moments, uh, deals with keeping the Thanksgiving spirit going. Uh, but today is the first Sunday of Advent, so I wanted to give a nod to Advent. We're not really preparing for the Advent season. It's here. Uh, we are in Advent season as we celebrate uh, the season of our Lord's birth. And I found this great devotional I want to read to you uh, about the reign of God begins now. Psalm 96 and verse 10 says, Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He will judge the peoples with equity. The devotional goes like this. Most musicians agree that the climax of Handel's great work, Messiah, is the magnificent Hallelujah Chorus. That great work celebrates Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and He shall reign forever and ever. Forever is a long time, and in fact, it means that Christ reigns above and beyond time as we know it. Our human inclination is to think that the reign of Christ is yet to come, off in the future somewhere. But the truth and the mystery is that the reign of Christ is now, too, right now. Our cynical minds wonder how that could be true with so much injustice and evil abroad in the world, but it is true. What a great comfort that is for us, not only during this season, while we have to suffer evil and injustice in our world, yet we can still confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And the good news of His promised presence in my world is the ultimate source of strength and confidence that I and we all need to stand 
and live responsibly each day. Look for the signs of Christ's presence in your world, and you will discover that the Christ child who was born in Bethlehem, the lamb who was slain, the king of kings, has begun his reign in you. The prayer for the devotional is, Jesus, as we prepare to welcome you in your coming as a child, may we also know and serve you as a king. Welcome then, College Place, this first Sunday of the Advent season as we look forward to further celebrations of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Today's message is about keeping Thanksgiving going beyond Thanksgiving. And when I say Thanksgiving, I'm not just talking about the day Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving week or even Thanksgiving season. I'm thinking about Thanksgiving uh, as a lifestyle, a lifestyle for Christians, not only here at College Place, uh, but all over the world. Uh, I love the holidays. Uh, I'm not sure there's a holiday I don't like, but, but if I had to rank them, it is pretty tough for Christians to top Easter. And then Christmas is pretty much everybody's favorite, especially the kids. But Thanksgiving for me is right in there in third place. And, and I love Thanksgiving not only for the day and, and for the eating and for getting together with family, but it is sort of the gateway to some other holidays because the Advent season is starting, New Year's is coming, and uh, so Thanksgiving is a great time. The problem with Thanksgiving is because it's so close to Christmas. I, I don't want to speak for everybody. I know I do this. I think some in my family do this. Maybe you as a Christian have struggled with this. Sometimes we're eager to rush past Thanksgiving and get to Christmas and get into the Advent season and celebrate Happy New Year. And uh, there'll be plenty of time for that. But I don't want us to sleep on Thanksgiving and uh, take it for granted, not, not only that one day, not only that one week, but just the importance of the practice of giving thanks with our lips, giving thanks uh, in our lives. And so today I'm talking about four different ways for us to keep the spirit of Thanksgiving alive well beyond that fourth Thursday in November. Before we talk about that, let's pray. Father, thank you uh, on behalf of the Vernons. Thank you on behalf of my brothers and sisters here at College Place for this Thanksgiving day and this Thanksgiving weekend that we've just experienced. Uh, some of us, as we gather to worship uh, on TV, even now, we're still with family. We're still finishing up the Thanksgiving weekend. Father, remind us that tomorrow, when the Thanksgiving weekend is officially over, uh, Lord, you want us to continue to be a people that show an attitude of gratitude. You want us to be a people that continue to thank you each day in our quiet time. Thank you uh, with the way we live, with the way we serve, with our attitude, with the way we give. And so, Father, I just pray that you could use these reminders from Scripture and from testimony uh, to impress upon us uh, to keep the Thanksgiving spirit alive well into 2022. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. This first way is not such a serious one, but it's one that we all deal with. Thanksgiving leftovers certainly remind us of what we had to eat yesterday, three days ago, the big Thanksgiving meal. Now, I, I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite talking about leftovers because I don't know if I'm a food snob. I, I don't know what you'd call me. I'm not a huge fan of leftovers. And uh, I got to say, even though my wife's a great cook, I, I want to kind of eat it the day she fixed it or be done with it. The one exception I would make to that during the year is uh, Thanksgiving leftovers. I don't know if it's just because there's a lot of them and you feel like you're being a bad steward if you don't eat all that stuff. Uh, but there's some great leftovers. I, I guess my two favorites, uh, I think I could eat macaroni and cheese every day the rest of my life. And so we always cook more macaroni and cheese than we ever eat. And uh, that's pretty fun to get out and warm that up. Even somebody like me that is uh, challenged in the kitchen to fix anything, I, I can heat up macaroni and cheese. And the other one, uh, I got to give some props to my wife's broccoli salad. Uh, it's nice for me to know that it's healthy for me and has some good things in there, uh, but it's good the day after. So those are a couple of my favorite leftovers. Now, I'm not a big turkey guy, so I polled some people that love turkey, and I got some of their favorite uses for turkey leftovers. I won't read them all to you, but I thought some of these were good. Here's some creative things you can do with turkey leftovers. Turkey sandwiches, that's pretty easy. Instead of sausage biscuits, turkey biscuits. Turkey chili, hadn't really thought of that. Turkey tacos, I like the alliteration there. And then the increasingly popular turkey milkshake. If you've not tried that, you want to make sure you get you some vanilla ice cream. And listen, if you put enough chocolate syrup in that, you don't even taste the turkey. So there we go with some leftovers to keep Thanksgiving going. These next three, a little more serious. 
Uh, I hope these are things you're already doing. I hope these won't be new things, but even if they are new things, uh, no time like the end of Thanksgiving holiday as we move into the Advent season to really incorporate this into your spiritual life. The second one is just to study God's Word. Listen, it's important to study God's Word year-round, but especially in a season where we're being called upon with our family, with our churches, with the nation, to be thankful for all that God has blessed us with. Um, the scriptures contain a lot of things, but certainly one of the things that all 66 books contain is testimonies of kings, testimonies of prophets, testimonies uh, of people that were healed uh, of everything that God has done for them and the thankfulness they felt towards God. So studying God's Word is a great way to not only fill our hearts with gratitude, but to keep that thanksgiving spirit alive. Now, all of God's Word is helpful. I think you can find thanksgiving in just about any one of the 66 books of Scripture. But I want to focus specifically on some Scripture this morning that highlights thanksgiving uh, as an attitude and also as a prayer discipline. Uh, Psalm 136, verses 1 through 4. I want to read that for you. Uh, really, the entire Psalms might be the best place if I could just pick one book that highlights Thanksgiving. So uh, almost any of the Psalms are going to have some kind of Thanksgiving in them. But specifically, some of them are devoted to Thanksgiving. And this Psalm 136, the entire Psalm is great. But here then, verses 1 through 4, Psalm 136, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lord. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. If you don't have a Bible in front of you, you noticed even just as I was reading it to you, or if you do have a Bible in front of you, you'll notice every verse ends with his love endures forever. That is a reminder that whatever else is true, God loves us eternally, not just yesterday, not just today, but tomorrow and on into eternity. Certainly that is something to fill our hearts with thanksgiving during this season and year round. The next scripture I'd want to highlight would be Ephesians chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but Ephesians chapter 1, we studied this some last Sunday when I went over the ABCs of spiritual blessings. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 talks about God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Every Christian, once they bow the knee to Jesus Christ as their Savior, every Christian gets forgiveness, gets eternal life, gets companionship, gets guidance, is sealed in the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 literally reads like a catalog of the things we inherit, not because we've earned them, but because we've put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and because we are now His son in the faith, because we are now His daughter in the faith, these are all the things we have. So you can literally read through Ephesians 1 and give thanks for each phrase, each spiritual blessing that you have. It's a great way to be reminded of how grateful you and I need to be each and every day. And then last but certainly not least, I want to read you the story from Luke chapter 17, Gospel of Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 17. This is the healing by Jesus, of ten men with leprosy. Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into the village, ten men had leprosy. They met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now notice... They weren't cleansed until they did what Jesus asked. So sometimes God just heals us without us having to do anything. But sometimes God asked us to participate in the healing. And certainly that was the case with these lepers. So he asked them to go show themselves to the priest. As they're on the way to the priest, they were healed. The story continues. Verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God. In a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Now, that might not be a big deal to you, but a Samaritan was somebody of mixed race. They had both Jewish blood in them and also Gentile blood in them. 
So the Jews looked down on the Samaritans, and the Gentiles looked down on the Samaritans. They were social outcasts. They were about as low in the social caste system as you could be. So it is not lost on readers of Scripture that this isn't just anybody going back and thanking Jesus. This is the Samaritan who's at the bottom of the barrel in terms of how other people view him. He's the only one that comes back to Jesus. Verse 17, Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus is certainly appreciative of the one who came back. But Jesus notices that the other nine, I'm sure they were thrilled to be healed. I'm sure they thought about, boy, I'm glad that guy healed me. Boy, I'm glad Jesus had that power. But not a single one of them, other than the Samaritan, bothered to come back and look at Jesus and tell him. Church, I would just say there's not a lot of challenge in this sermon today, but this is a point of challenge for myself, for you. Don't be one of the nine. Don't be one who God heals, who God delivers, who God blesses, who God forgives, who God extends love to, who God extends grace to. Don't be one of the nine that never goes back and tells Jesus, well, pastor, I, you know, I, I felt gratitude in my heart. I didn't just tell Jesus. That, that's sort of like saying to your wife or to your husband or, or to your coworker or to your best friend, listen, that Christmas gift you gave me, that was awesome, or the birthday present was awesome. I, I felt it in my heart. I just never said anything to you. Well, well, how would they know? So it's important for us to tell Jesus, yes, he's omniscient. I understand that. But he's honored when you and I thank him for huge things. And I would say healing, being healed of leprosy is a huge thing. Or, or even small things. Maybe it's not a small thing to you. Sometimes we treat it like a small thing. I didn't do this when I was in my 20s. I didn't do this when my in my 30s or 40s. But now in my 50s, almost every day, I, I'd say 90% of my days, I thank God that I could get up today, that I could breathe today, that I could walk around. Listen, you and I have loved ones. We have brothers and sisters in Christ right here in this church. It's tough for them to physically get out of bed. Now, none of us could be at church today because we didn't have in-person worship, but there are plenty of Sundays where we've got folks that are part of College Place, part of other churches that love Jesus just as much as you and I do. Physically, they can't get there. It's too hard to breathe. It's too hard to move. They're too vulnerable to getting involved with COVID-19 infection. There's a lot of reasons that people have to stay away from church because of their health. So we should never take our health for granted. And yet here's Jesus healing 10 lepers. Only one out of 10. Wow, what a terrible percentage. Only one out of 10 came back and thanked him. And it bothered Jesus. And Jesus noticed. You and I don't want to hurt Jesus by being like those nine. Hey, I'll take my blessing. Hey, hey, I'll take my answered prayer. Hey, I'll take my forgiveness. Hey, I'll take my healing. I, I'm too busy. I, you know, Jesus knows I, I appreciate it. Go back and tell him. Now, you and I can't tell him face to face until we get to heaven, but we can tell him person to person because he's always with us. Jesus is Emmanuel. Last scripture I want to talk about in terms of studying God's word to keep the thanksgiving spirit alive is over in Colossians chapter 1. Remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, they're right there together. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. This is a prayer that Paul is praying for the church at Colossae. But it's a prayer he could pray for the church at College Place. It's a prayer you can pray for yourself. It's a prayer you can pray for folks in your family. It's a prayer you can pray for other members of our church. But as we read it, I not only want it to be a prayer that you pray once and put up till next Thanksgiving, I'd like for it to be a scripture that you and I meditate on. Some of us are better at memorizing Scripture than others, but this would be a great Scripture to memorize, to read every day, to stick on a note card and stick it in your car, stick it on your refrigerator. Listen to what Paul prays for the Colossians, chapter 1 and verse 10. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please Him in every way. 
bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father. Listen, the, the whole prayer is awesome. He's talking about them growing in their faith, being stronger in their faith. But he ends it, my prayer for you, Colossians, is that you will joyfully be giving thanks to the Father. Don't want to insult your intelligence this morning, but why do we need to joyfully give thanks? Well, well, if you give thanks to anybody and there's not some joy, there's not some enthusiasm, you might be telling them, hey, thank you for that nice anniversary present. But if there's not a little joy in your voice, they might think, you know, that didn't really sound genuine. Or if you tell somebody, listen, I, I really appreciate that Christmas gift that you gave me. It's one of the nicest things anybody's ever done for me. There's a difference in saying that. Thank you for that Christmas gift. Wow, what a surprise. That's one of the best things I got the whole season. Do you see the difference? You and I can say the same thing. But if there's joy, if there's enthusiasm, if there's some zest in how we say it to the person, it comes across as more powerful. It's the same with God. So Paul wants us to joyfully give thanks to the Father. Not just grow in our faith. Not, not just serve Him. Not just attend church. Not just have a great Christian witness. Not just live a life that is pleasing to God in every way. All that's important. But the last thing that he prays for the Colossians in that passage is that you would joyfully give thanks to the Father. You see, when we joyfully give thanks to the Father, not only does it honor God, not only does it protect our attitude from getting bad, from getting bitter, not only does it bless others around us, but it's a great witness to those who might not yet know Christ. So those are just a few highlights from God's Word about uh, thankfulness, gratitude, and I hope that will help you keep the spirit of thanksgiving going. Uh, a third way you and I can keep the spirit of thanksgiving going is just by praying prayers of thanks. Well, Pastor Duh, we know to do that. Okay, I, I think you probably do. But let me just give you some specific ways to do that. You hear me talk about this just about every time I'm talking about specifics of prayer life. I always want to give credit to Campus Crusade for Christ because this is where I learned to do it. The ABCs of Thanksgiving. In fact, I did an ABC sermon last Sunday. The ABCs of spiritual blessing. You can do this at home. Whether you ever preach, whether you ever teach Sunday school or not. The ABCs of Thanksgiving. And so, <clears throat> how does that work? Well, you go through the 26 letters of the alphabet. And you think of something that starts with the letter A that you're thankful for. For me, for example, Lord, I'm thankful that for my childhood in Atlanta. That's something I'm very thankful for. So then I go to the letter B. Lord, I'm thankful for my boys. That's my two sons, Rhett and Mitchell. The blessings they've been in my life. B, I think of boys. C, I, I, I can think of a lot of things, okay? But I think of Carolina. That's where I went to school. Not only did I go to school there, that's where I got saved. That's where my life changed eternally because I met Jesus Christ at Carolina, the University of North Carolina. So you go through the alphabet. What is the point of going through every letter? Well, first of all, it'll take you a minute. That's what the kids say. It's going to take you longer than a minute. But it'll take you a minute to go through 26 letters. And that's the point. If you're like Sam or maybe some of my brothers and sisters would join me in this confession this morning. Sometimes I, I want to confess my sins, and then I want to get to the part of my prayer life where, God, I, I got a lot of stuff to ask you for, for myself, for my family, for my church, and that's okay. I, I don't think God says, ask me for less stuff. I think God says, church, Sam, put your name in there. How about thanking me more often? And so when you go through A, B, C, D, all the way through Z, it's going to take you a little while, and that's the point of it. It's really not that hard. I, I'm going to give you permission. I checked with Lord. I'm going to give you permission to cheat on X. X is hard uh, unless you're a musician and you got a brand new xylophone and you're really excited about it and you want to thank God for that xylophone. It is hard to find things that start with the letter X that you're particularly thankful for. So you can cheat on that one and go with something that starts with EX. But all the others, you, you just got to do a little work. And then here's what's cool about the ABCs. You can do it again the next day and try to come up with different letters. And challenge yourself to find all the creative things God's done for you 
yesterday, last month, last year, last decade, and it can be ABCs of Thanksgiving in general. It can be ABCs of things I'm thankful for about my church. It can be ABCs of things I'm thankful for about my family. You can customize the list. It's a great way to keep that spirit of Thanksgiving going all year long. A second thing you can do is a prayer discipline. And again, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I'm not currently doing this. I've done this before. My wife does this, and it's a great way to organize your prayer life. I've been around Christians that have done this through the years. Organize different categories of thankfulness. So I just made this one up, but I've heard these before. For example, I've had friends that said, like on Sundays, they would be thankful for things they learned in church that day. So they're not only expressing thanks to God, but it helps them uh, cement in their mind what they heard in Sunday school, what they heard in the sermon, what what the choir anthem was about, whatever particularly they learned in Sunday school or church that day. So that's what they give thanks for on Sundays. On Mondays, they give thanks for things about current or past employment. Mondays kind of go back to work day for most of America. Go back to work day. So Monday is... You know, probably if you polled Americans, Monday's probably the least favorite weekday of the year, of the year, of the week. But that's a way to have prayer on Monday. Things I'm thankful for about my current employment situation or past employment, jobs that I've had that I've loved. Tuesday, thank God for material blessings. Wednesday, thank God for spiritual blessings. Thursday, thank God for the difficulties or trials or challenges that you now face. Pastor, what? You you want me to thank God for the difficulties that I'm in right now, for trials that I'm undergoing right now, for challenges in my life right now? Not only do I want you to do it, Scripture wants you to do it. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18. Short verse, short passage, but powerful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Be joyful always. That's tough right there. Pray continually. That's tough right there. It means to be in a spirit of prayer. Obviously, if we prayed all the time, we we couldn't evangelize. We we couldn't read our scripture. We couldn't eat. We couldn't sleep. But it means to be continually in a spirit of prayer, which is kind of what we're talking about today. Be continually in a spirit of thanksgiving. So 1 Thessalonians 5.16, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. That's right. The scripture says give thanks in all circumstances. Now, I don't know about you, I don't have any problem giving God thanks when things go my way. When life is working out like I envisioned it. When good things happen to me or my family or my church. Boy, I'm first in line to thank God. God, that was awesome. God, you're good. Do it again. Do it some more. But how about when things don't work out for us? How about when there's sickness? How about when we run out of gas and we're late to a really important appointment? How about when a friend hurts us? How about when things at our church don't unfold just like we were hoping they would? How about when we have a broken relationship with somebody in our family that seems like it's getting worse before it's getting better? Am I supposed to give thanks in those situations? Yes. I did a sermon on this last Thanksgiving season. I'm not going to preach that whole sermon again. But remember, you're not giving God thanks that this person's sick. You're not giving God thanks that this person died. You're not giving God thanks that this bad thing happened to your family, you're giving thanks in all circumstances that God is still God, God is still good, God still has a plan, God is still in control, God can still, Romans 8, 28, figure out a way to bring himself glory in my pain, in your struggle, in the church's struggle, in the nation's struggle. God is still all those things, and so that's what it means to give thanks in all circumstances. So back to our list. Sundays, things we learned in church. Mondays, I'm thankful for current or past employment. Tuesdays, I'm thankful for material blessings. Wednesday, for spiritual blessings. Thursdays, for difficulties. Fridays, do the alliteration. Fridays is a day to be thankful for friends. I promise you, the more you give God thanks for specific friends, the more you call their names in prayer, the more they'll be on your heart, the more likely you are to pray for them the more likely you are to be appreciative of them when you're in their presence. And last but not least, Saturday, and I don't think we can do this enough, things that we're thankful for about our nation. Right now our nation is under attack from outside. It is also under attack from within. 
We've got a lot of hate America theology going in the church, sometimes outside the church. Listen, America is not perfect, but I think if you and I on a regular basis would give thanks to God for our Judeo-Christian heritage, for all the great things God has been able to accomplish through the United States of America, for all the good things that are true about our country right now, it doesn't make all the bad disappear. It doesn't make all the injustice disappear. It doesn't make all the evil and sin disappear. But it makes us more appreciative of our country. And it's a good place to start in praying for our nation. Last but not least, the fourth way to keep Thanksgiving going well beyond November is to keep connections going with family. Now, I don't know how it works out for you when you get together with your family. I have some family that I see throughout the year. But then, really, my, my wife's sister's family, the only time I really see them is I see them for a couple of days of Thanksgiving and a couple of days of Christmas. I, I wish we saw each other more, but listen, those are precious times, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And so, one of the things I, I say every year that I'm not very good about following up on is, you know, I, I ought to call them more often, or I ought to try to go see them more often. Or I ought to write them a card more often. Or I ought to text or email or something more often during the year. I know y'all are probably tired of hearing about my high school reunion by now, but it just impacted me in a lot of ways. And one of my best friends that I caught up with, and he and I both decided instead of just seeing each other every five years and just catching on up on each other's lives every five years, we're going to actually start exchanging Christmas cards. That's a big step for men. We're going to start doing phone calls, maybe not every week, but, but certainly once every month or so, just to call, how's your family doing, how's the job, how are things going? And so that's a way, especially if family is a big part of your Thanksgiving celebration, that's a way to keep the Thanksgiving spirit alive and going. Now, family that you see that live in the same town, that you see regularly, maybe this isn't as big a deal to you because you're already in constant contact. But I would say especially for family that's out of town, that you only see once, twice a year, uh, it's such an important thing. Christmas is coming up. You know I'm big on Christmas evangelism. Christmas card evangelism is easy. Instead of sending that Christmas card that has a picture of Frosty the Snowman on it, as much as I love Frosty the Snowman, how about a Christmas card that somebody's already written, somebody's already done the hard work, there's already a Bible verse printed on it. There's already a Christian message. And just signed by you, hey, love you guys, thinking about you, hope you can find the same joy in Christ that we have. Is that going to lead them to fall down and pray to receive Christ? Probably not, but it plants a seed. Or maybe in that Christmas card, you can invite them to church. Or maybe in that Christmas card, you could say, hey, this is one of my favorite Bible verses and explain to them why. There's a lot of things you can do with a Christian Christmas card. It helps you keep in touch with family. It's good evangelism. It's kind of the one time of the year we can write somebody a card or a letter and it not seem like such a big deal. Oh, why, why is Sam writing? Why is my cousin writing? Why is granddad writing? Well, everybody kind of expects people to reach out to them during Christmas with Christmas cards. I think this is a great way to keep that connection going with our family, especially for potential believers. Folks will say to me all the time, Pastor, I, I feel odd asking family members if they know Christ. I understand that. A Christmas card is a great way to do it. Simply to say, hey, I look forward to seeing you at our Christmas gathering. We, we hadn't really talked about church in a while. I, I, I've got some things I'd love to share with you if, if we could take 10 minutes. Just kind of let them know you want to talk to them. Sometimes that can spur a conversation. So combine that desire to keep Thanksgiving going with that desire to keep connected to your family, with that desire to reach folks for Christ, and the Christian Christmas card is a great way to do it. So those are four ways to keep the Thanksgiving spirit going. They're not the only way. But in conclusion, I hope all of us as believers, whatever denomination, as long as we bow to the knee of Christ, can agree that Thanksgiving's not just a day. It's not just the fourth Thursday in November. It's not just a season. But it really is a lifestyle to show God an attitude of gratitude. Gratitude in our lives that is evident. Remember, it glorifies God. It blesses those around us. And it is a great witness. So College Place United Methodist Church, hope your Thanksgiving was awesome. Hope you'll keep the Thanksgiving spirit going 
not only into December, but well into 2022. And since we did acknowledge that today is also the first Sunday of Advent, as we let go of Thanksgiving, look forward to celebrating the birth of Christ, I want to be among the first to wish you a very Merry Christmas. God bless. See you in church Sunday.